Hey, what's up everybody? It's Kellen here from Start Your Systems and welcome to Ride the Track Map Daytona 2022 by TFC and G-Dub MX. Where we're gonna play the track Daytona 2022 today and talk about the 2022 Daytona Supercross. That's right, I'm doing MX Bikes today because normally I would do this video playing uh, Monster Energy Supercross 4 or 3 or 2 or whatever and I would have built the track in game but as some of you guys know, there isn't a Daytona stadium to use for those games, and it's pretty difficult to fit a full Daytona inside of the rectangular stadiums. You can fit some sort of semblance of a Daytona track in those stadiums, and uh, definitely like two has a better version of the stadium to use. Uh, but aside from that, the Daytona track really doesn't fit in those stadiums very well. And we have the sim games to play to play the Daytona track, because MX Simulator obviously had uh, the Daytona Supercross already, and then uh, MX Bikes, they have this Ride the Track Map version come out every week by TFC and G-Dub, uh, and I'll talk about them in just a minute, but just felt like jumping over and playing this today. Of course, the Aerial guys will have this track come out in a couple weeks' time, but they're a little bit behind schedule now with their series um, after just like a few things had come up and the game updated, and, and they actually almost had to postpone this week because of server issues, so uh, we're not going to get Daytona from Aerial until a couple weeks from now, I think, but... We'll get there. We'll get there when it's time. As for this track, though, by G-Dub, by uh, TFC, this is the Moto X Collective Group. They actually have been making these tracks. I think they've done all nine rounds so far. And it's a cool little thing where they basically take the overhead track map that's put out by Monster Energy Supercross and then build a track that kind of like mimics where the jump placement is uh, on these tracks. So... They, they do a pretty good job of getting it like as close as it's going to be to the real track because it's based off of a blueprint. Now, the real track did change up a little bit from what we're seeing here. Like this on off right here didn't exist. It just went straight into the this jump right here and, and a couple other things. But uh, normally speaking, they released this track before the race. This time they released it like the night before the race happened. So it was like right butting up to the event. And again, like there's no way they're going to change stuff up that quickly. So I get it, you know, it's not gonna be a perfect rendition of Daytona, but it's pretty awesome. And a couple things that I learned today was, uh, I didn't know that G-Dub was super involved with tracks. He's uh, another YouTuber, I guess, kind of like myself that does MX Bikes content. He's been doing MX Bikes content for a very long time. I'm sure some of you guys have seen him. Uh, he's got a much better voice than me as well too. So definitely would recommend checking him out. And uh, another thing is I didn't know that TFC was British. So it's a couple of British dudes building these tracks. But you learn something new every day, and it's really cool that they put out these tracks. So I always wanted to get down and ride one of these tracks for video. Didn't really know of a good way to do it, but now we're going to talk about the Daytona Supercross and ride this track all the way home, have a little bit of fun doing it. So you can download this track yourself if you want to try it in the description below and check it out. Be sure to support the creators and the people that put these together because they're an awesome group of people that give us the content to play. All right, let's talk about Daytona. And let's just jump right into it. Jason Anderson and Malcolm Stewart getting into it again. It was the same story that we saw last week in Arlington, the first round of the, or the first race in the triple header. Uh, those two got together. Ooh, nice front flip right there. Um, those two got together and it might've cost Malcolm Stewart a chance at winning his first race, which would have been, you know, just one of the three triple crown races. I don't think he's going to win the overall that night. So I think it caused Jason Anderson a win at the overall and then this week they did get together again and this week I think it cost both of them but definitely Malcolm Stewart a chance to win the Daytona Supercross and we're going to talk about it and, and, and break it down from all angles. So first thing I wanted to highlight before we even get into this discussion is that it seems to me that people are just kind of acting like Jason is just like a rogue you know torpedo on Malcolm this year or something like that and, and it the these two have never had any history, which is very wrong. These two have had history a lot. Uh, these two have ran into each other many, many times. Malcolm's as guilty as Jason is over the years. And, um, you know, there's no one side that's right or wrong at this point. I'm just saying that both of them have had a history of running into each other. Um, you know, everybody has been throwing up the collisions at Dallas last year where Anderson, you know, put in an aggressive block pass on Malcolm. Then Malcolm tried to get him back and tried to tee him up, but then just went flying off the track in the end. Um, but you can go back to like 2014 Anaheim two, they got together. So, I, you know, it's, they've just got a long history anyway, beside that point, uh, you just go back to this year, Malcolm Stewart takes Jason Anderson down in the heat race at Anaheim 1, and then the Arlington thing happens, and Jason admitted fault and said like he 
he knew he was coming in too hot. He knew he kind of blew it. So in that regard, you're kind of looking at like Malcolm took Anderson out and then Anderson didn't mean to take Malcolm out, but I don't think Malcolm meant to take Anderson out. So I don't know. To me, it's kind of like they've both had their shots now and this is Malcolm rebuttaling for the most recent shot, but this is just going to keep going on and on and on and any semblance of this needs to be knocked off or whatever isn't going to happen because these two guys are pretty hard-headed individuals in my opinion. But anyway, what happened? Start of the main event. You got Cooper Webb grabbing the whole shot. Malcolm Stewart is in like fourth, but then jumps between uh, Eli Tomac and Jason Anderson to shoot into second place as they're going into the second corner of the track, which as you can tell on this track is the very, very far right-hand side of the racetrack. Uh, if you're looking at it on the map view in the upper right-hand corner of the screen, uh, you know, very far right side of the racetrack if you're in the grandstands, whatever. Point being, it's a very, very long straightaway to the second turn into a bull corner. Uh, and Cooper Webb goes into the bull corner in the lead, kind of rails around the outside. Now Stewart comes into the corner and he kind of cuts down out of the berm a little bit early and meets Eli Tomac there. And meeting Eli Tomac to the inside of Tomac is Jason Anderson. They all three kind of bump elbows and Stewart gets shot off the right side of the track. Now Malcolm Stewart lost the Daytona Supercross in this very moment because the second he went off the track, he clicked into fourth gear rode alongside of the track and uh, jumped back on still in third place now behind Anderson. So technically speaking, he didn't gain any positions, but he did gain an advantage and we'll get to that in a moment. But uh, can't do that, dude. Doesn't matter how frustrated you are at what Anderson did or didn't do. Uh, going off the track and accelerating off the track has been a no-no throughout the years and people have been penalized for it. And the way that he did it was kind of egregious. But then he rejoins the track. Anderson blows the very next corner. So this is all happening in this straightaway right here. Anderson comes down to this corner. He goes a little bit deep because the inside line was kind of the way to go. He goes kind of like mid corner. And then when he squares back off, bam, Malcolm Stewart up the inside teeing up Jason Anderson. So that's kind of the synopsis of the whole situation. But here's my take on it, right? Objectively, a bad move. I'm sorry. I know people are like, yes. Malcolm get Jason back you know like he deserves it Anderson's been riding like an idiot all year long and I get it I think Jason deserves one as well I think that the move in Arlington is, is justified to get payback at that point and I get that Malcolm was seeing red but if, if Malcolm could have just like just for like a split second thought about that a little bit longer rejoin the track safely in fourth behind uh, Tomac and not gain an advantage off the racetrack he might have won that race he was fastest in, in qualifying, won his heat race, fastest all day long, and um, I I'm bummed because he probably could have won that race. Like, Cooper Webb got out front, but Malcolm was faster than him. Tomac didn't look the best all day long, got pretty good by the midpoint of the main event, but I still think Malcolm was faster, and all that stuff just flustered Malcolm to the point where he felt like he needed to pay Jason back, which, again, I get. I'm not saying that he shouldn't, but I'm just saying I think in that situation – he could have won the race and paid Jason back at a different time when things were not flowing as smoothly. Uh, but that's, you know, hindsight is twenty twenty, and I get it. I just, for Malcolm's sake, I'm frustrated because that, that could have been the race victory for him. I'm not frustrated because he got hit by Anderson again or, or whatever. I'm just frustrated because he could have won the race and that sucks. On the flip side of it, this is something that uh, Anderson kind of should have known was going to happen and maybe should have had a little bit better wherewithal to think about this. But I do think that in the second turn of the race, which everybody's pointing at, where uh, Anderson comes up the inside and hits Tomac, and then Tomac gets sent into Stewart, and then Stewart goes off the track, I feel like people are crying wolf that Anderson did that on purpose to go after Malcolm. I think he was going after Tomac, trying to maybe either put Tomac on the ground or just move him out of the way and get ahead of him. Because look, not for nothing, up until this week, Anderson and Tomac were the two guys fighting for the championship. Yes, I know Malcolm Stewart is still very mathematically alive and right in the mix, but personally speaking, I think it was just between Anderson and Tomac. So I think Anderson thinks it's between himself and Tomac, and he's trying to do something about Eli Tomac in the second corner of the race. Lo and behold, Malcolm Stewart happens to be on the outside of that. I don't think that it was a situation where Anderson hitting Tomac was because he was trying to punt Tomac into to Stewart. It's just the second corner of the race and stuff like that happens. Hell, you go back to the third main event a week ago in Arlington, 
And Malcolm, I don't think on purpose, got into Anderson pretty good in the second quarter of the race. Like, it's just what happens because there's, you know, cutting down and first lap shenanigans and, and all that stuff. It just happens. So I think that, you know, Malcolm reacted the way he did, and that's fine. But I don't necessarily think that it was uh, reacting to Anderson doing something against him. I think it was just reacting to being sick of Anderson's antics probably. And, and you know, everybody crying wolf about Anderson in the second corner there is – more or less barking up the wrong tree in my opinion but anderson does ride a little bit ridiculous i'm not saying he's a saint or anything like that i'm just saying there's two flip sides of the coin and i don't think that the second turn was as bad as people were making it sound is what i'm trying to get at uh anyway the whole roundabout situation of this is that anderson because he chose to do what he did to malcolm in arlington probably has now just cost himself a chance at the 2022 title because uh you know they kind of mess with each other the rest of the race from that point on like they were never with you know any more than like 10 seconds apart uh they got together a couple different times uh they really probably could have made better progress through the field if they weren't messing with each other but they didn't and in the end they finished seventh and eighth but because malcolm on the first lap of the race does the off-track excursion then later on he actually got together with anderson anderson went off the track and then anderson accelerating along the side of the track also gets the same penalty. They both got a one place penalty for gaining advantage off the racetrack. So they go from finishing seventh and eighth back to eighth and ninth. Ken Roxon moves up two places because of it. And lo and behold, Eli Tomac has a comfortable championship lead out of nowhere. So the frustrating part of it as a fan is, uh, you know, the championship kind of got blown wide open. The frustrating part of it as a fan is that Malcolm Stewart could have won his first main event. Uh, but the positive side of it as a fan is that we got drama, you know, like Malcolm Stewart and Jay Sanderson don't like each other. That's obvious. Uh, it seems like they're not afraid to continue hitting each other. That's obvious. And, uh, this seems like it's going to keep going on. So yeah, I, I, it doesn't seem like anything's going to get solved. Anderson's on probation. Malcolm is not, but neither one of those I think was like all that intentional. And the argument that Husky put up, I think in Malcolm's, uh, defense was that, yeah, Malcolm was probably seeing red. Yeah, maybe he did hit Anderson on purpose. But Anderson also ridiculously blew the corner before they even made contact. So, um, you know, in Husky slash Malcolm's defense, maybe that was just contact waiting to happen. I, I digress. The point is, I think Malcolm was going to put Anderson on the ground, whether it was right then or four corners after that. He was clearly not uh, happy with him anymore at that point. And that's what happens. Uh, there's a quote that... I, uh, I follow a YouTuber called Emplem, and, and there's a quote that he has in one of his documentaries that I feel like fits this perfectly. And the gist of it was basically like, don't, don't take someone out when you have nothing to gain because that same person might have uh, nothing to lose in the future. And that's kind of the case that happened here. But in this situation, I think Malcolm did have nothing to lose. I think that, you know, if you get to rounds 15, 16, Anderson's in it with a title chance. Malcolm suddenly isn't. Malcolm doesn't have anything to lose and Anderson way back at Arlington had you know kind of nothing to gain like he could have passed Malcolm and won that first race but he also could have finished second and won the overall um you know it, it's just going back to this whole situation it, it's a bad situation for both riders at this point nothing is good is really happening for either rider and I get Malcolm being frustrated um but he could have won this race so that's my take on it, and I get people are going to be upset and be like, oh, but Anderson, he does it all the time. And it's like, oh, but Malcolm does it quite a bit too. And then there's going to be people on the flip side of things saying like, oh, Malcolm's such a punk. Why does he always do this? And, uh, you know, he needs to think better about it and whatever. And, and I guess maybe you could say that as well, but also sometimes in those situations, riders just start seeing red, <laughs> or in Malcolm's case, start seeing green. And... Uh, want to make sure that they do not see green anymore for lack of a better word so anyway you know it's frustrating it is what it is but uh i just wish that we could have seen malcolm and jason up there battling because the main event turned into a pretty awesome battle you have cooper webb leading most of the race i definitely didn't have cooper webb leading and possibly winning the daytona supercross on my card this year uh, especially with the troubles that he's had this year but i mean dude looked really solid through most of the race um, you know, I think probably what helped him the most is that he struggled a lot in the whoops this year and the whoops at this particular round were not big. So that probably helped a little bit, but, uh, yeah, he just looks solid and, and darn near maybe could have won that race. 
if not for the Shane McElrath situation. And again, there's there's two flip sides of the coin with fans. I feel like I'm seeing some fans saying, oh, Eli Tomac is just going to pass him anyway. It's stupid to even complain about McElrath. And then there's some fans saying that, like, you know, Cooper Webb probably could have held him off because he's, you know, super good with racecraft and everything like that. And I do think there's something to be said for the fact that by the time Webb got around McElrath, Tomac was already, like, two seconds ahead of him because that is how much McElrath had held up Webb. But uh, I, I think for a little bit of that, you know, Webb is just like, I'm not going to catch him again. He's going faster than me, so I might as well just settle in for second here, and that's probably why he ends up five seconds down. I don't think Eli Tomac was going that much faster than Cooper Webb, uh, and I don't think that Cooper Webb fell off that bad uh, because his fitness was way off or whatever. I just think that that's the situation as it unfolded. Uh, regardless of which, again, for us fans, it took away a pretty good race. I don't think that it's McElrath's fault. I think that he was trying very hard to get out of the way and just caught Webb at a, at a you know kind of weird spot of the racetrack where you know coming through this section, Webb was down the far right side of the track. McElrath is trying to get out of the way, so he goes to the far right side of the track, blocks Webb off. I, I think that you know Webb will look back at that situation and be like, yeah, I mean, it is what it is. Like McElrath did block me, but it wasn't on purpose, and you know stuff happens. But in the end, yeah, Webb is just he's not having a good season. Things are not going his way whatsoever and things continue to, to not go his way and uh, we're halfway through this championship and I'm I'm almost starting to wonder whether or not Webb actually wins one of these things I think he will but he hasn't won one yet and you know he's like 31 points down the championship so I think his championship fight is over but uh, man is he even going to win one of these races it's kind of crazy to think that the defending champion who we all thought coming into the season probably had another shot at winning this title no problem might not even win a race this year but man it's just been such a rough year for him and um you know daytona is a bright spot but even so there's still some things to be talked about with this and, and it wasn't all roses and everything like that and you know got a start but things started unraveling a little bit he had a lead that just couldn't manage and tomac was coming and everything like that so yeah cooper webb weird enigma this year the positive enigma, though, is Eli Tomac has got this star Yamaha dialed in, it seems like, even on a day where it didn't look like he was maybe the fastest guy all day long or the best rider ever that we've ever seen at Daytona. Uh, but even on a day like this, Eli Tomac still comes through, shines through, and was uh, able to win the Daytona Supercross for the sixth time in his career. I don't know how I just wrote out of that. It just scrubbed the dragons back like crazy. Wins the Daytona Supercross for the sixth time in his career, becomes all-time winningest Daytona rider ever, and also moves into a tie for fifth all-time on the Supercross wins list with 41 career victories, now pulling even with Ryan Villapoto. And now I feel like the question begs, I don't necessarily think it's a question of whether or not Eli Tomac is going to win the title this year. I think he's, at this point, my title pick moving forward. But uh, how high is he going to get? Because... Next on his list, fourth all-time, Chad Reed on 44 wins, so he's only three wins away from that. Third all-time, Ricky Carmichael on 48 wins, so he's seven away from that. Uh, I don't think he gets there this year, but now it's definitely, I feel like, maybe in play if, if Tomac continues next year and still has good form. And then uh, second all-time, James Stewart's on 50. He's not getting to McGrath, that's for sure. He's not going to get to 72 wins, but he's only nine wins away from second all-time in Supercross, which is gnarly to think about. Um, you know, most of those guys didn't make it to their, you know, past 30, still winning races. Chad Reed did, but, uh, you know, Eli Tomac is 29 now. He's going to be 30 next year. It seems likely he's going to win races as a 30 year old. And, uh, man, could he get to second all time? That'd be pretty incredible. Uh, about to be a two time champion, which of course would match James Stewart and Chad Reed, who are two guys that are still ahead of him. I don't think he's going to get to Villapoto and Dungey who have four, but might get to three if things fall his way this year and next but uh, there's so many fast guys coming just feel like at some point uh the changing of the guard will happen it's just not going to happen this year anyway yeah tomac incredible great ride bike started smoking a little bit late but didn't seem like it was going to matter he had enough time in hand to still cruise to that win uh by the end of it so well done to eli tomac Let's talk 250 class just a little bit here to end this video. I don't want to spend too much more of your guys' time talking. But, uh, yeah, 250 class, Jet Lawrence, fantastic all day long. I mean, class of the field right now, I, I, I personally believe. I know Cameron McAdoo won the second round, and he looked very solid. But I think that this is kind of like Jet's title to lose in terms of a speed category. Like, I feel like he's going to be the fastest guy every week, and it's whether or not he makes the mistakes that cost him this championship or not. 
Uh, you know, he's already made a couple big mistakes, like at that Triple Crown. And uh, this week, he almost made a huge mistake in the heat race, thinking that the race is over a lap early, but collected himself, still won that, still won the main event. And uh, yeah, it's starting to look a lot like the Jet Lawrence we expected to see uh, in Supercross again. So yeah, he's looking fantastic. Uh, first trip to Daytona looked like he didn't have any problems figuring out the track or gelling with the facility. Um, so that's obviously a good sign for him. And moving forward, he's just the guy. Like I said, I, I think McAdoo is definitely going to have a say in this championship. I don't think he's just going to go away empty-handed. But uh, without Forkner, uh, Hampshire has had some up and down rounds and obviously got a little bit hurt at the last round and, and seems like uh, you know that probably took him out of the title hunt. Like I said, Forkner's out. J-Mart's now out with an injury. It's kind of down to whether or not Jet can hold off McAdoo or else we're going to have like Enzo Lopes winning the title. <laughs> but uh, yeah, kind of crazy that the 250 East has already divulged into this situation and Jet appears to be the guy. So yeah, I think moving forward, we have to just pretty much say that Jet Lawrence is going to be one of the fastest guys every single week in this 250 class. I personally kind of hope that like, I don't want to say that he dominates this, but that he stays on the game and on the form that he looked like this week moving forward because I want to see him versus Craig at the showdown which is going to be at Atlanta Motor Speedway Craig will be back in action at Seattle in a couple weeks time so you know he'll be able to get kind of refreshed a little bit again while Jet Lawrence is figuring stuff out but I feel like that's going to be a pretty epic battle those are two guys right now that are really feeling the flow in this 250 class really looking like they're uh, kind of hitting on all on all strides when it comes to speed and uh yeah just uh, really cool it's like someone was trying to watch my broadcast here not sure if he's going to be able to tune in or not but uh that's what happens when you're playing a steam game anyway i digress about that whole situation jet lawrence looked great at daytona goes home the winner eli tomac wins and we're on to detroit which i will be at this weekend irl sounds like it's going to be freezing cold so i'm really looking forward to just literally freezing my nips off but hey if you're going to detroit this weekend let me know always cool to catch up with you guys i know that i'm going to meet up with a couple of my buddies that live out in the michigan area as well so uh gonna be good to catch up with them and see how things are going up in the 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 northern part of the u.s and dealing with the cold weather up there and uh this weekend i'm gonna say jet lawrence wins 250s because he just looks that good right now 450s hmm i'm gonna go ando I'm going to say Anderson wins 450s because personally, I just hope that there's some semblance of a championship fight still in here after all this chaos with him and Malcolm and Tomac getting a big points lead. I just, you know, it'd be kind of nice to have like Tomac get like a fifth this weekend with an Anderson win just so we can be like, oh, you know, it, it still could happen. Like something crazy could happen. Not that I'm saying I want Tomac to get hurt or, or him to lose this title. I just, you know, as a fan perspective, want the title to keep going. Uh, but it's starting to kind of feel a little bit like Tomac is going to maybe take off and run with this thing down the stretch a little bit, but we'll see. Now moving to the second half of the season. Hey, the season always starts at Daytona, as they say, and, well, the season's definitely started, uh, but might also be ending as well. So we'll have to see what happens moving forward. As always, appreciate you guys stopping by and watching another video here on Start Your Systems. Hopefully you guys enjoyed the commentary and the gameplay here. Download the track in the description below. Shout out to TFC and G-Dub for the track, as always. And uh, shout out to all of you fine folks for tuning in and watching another video here on Star Your Systems. That's it for me, guys. I'll see you in the next one. So long for now.